bring in Anna Chalenta now. Anna, are you with us still? Yep. There she is. And Anna, um, again, is our partner at Georgetown University and our dear friend and co-collaborator and, and Quende Confense from the City of Ottawa and Music Policy Forum Board and Josh Kuhn from USC and all things that Josh Kuhn does and Josh Kuhn Extended Universe. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit because it's been amazing to talk sort of like granular data, like what are we seeing from audiences? What's the sort of sense on the ground related to the pandemic? Let's broaden this way back out. And all three of you have been thinking and writing and speaking and in different sets of collaborations with your peers, and with others about real broad issues about where are we even now, you know, sort of beyond the pandemic, where should we be, where could we be? And I'm going to, Anna, actually turn over to you a little bit to kind of frame the conversation, but what does it mean, you know, if we're going to have a, a whole restart of the music economy, what should that look like? What are the things we should be thinking about? And what is it, you know, wh where should we be taking this conversation, not just about reopening what we had before, but about what we could and should have, it, have in the future? Well, um, thanks. Thanks for um, letting us have this conversation. I would say uh, one of the things that really, there are two, like, of the little quotes that I've heard in the last few months that really struck me. One was, history has found us, like this is an historic moment. Um, we should be aware of that. You know, this is gonna be one of those times it's written about. And um, Scott Cohen of Warner the other day uh, made the comment that um, COVID-19 is the Napster moment for live music. And I think there's something to be said there. I, you know, we talk about going back to normal um, and you know, I wonder what that is. What fascinates me is kind of all of these um, new approaches to connecting over like we're doing right now with Zoom, uh, with musicians and live music and audiences and, and sort of building new networks and new sort of worlds. And so, um, you know, and this is something that I know that Quinde has thought about a lot and that Josh has thought a lot about. So I'm wondering, Josh, I'll start with you. Um, you've been thinking about some of these issues for quite a long time. Like how does music symbolize kind of who we are? You have that great, um, and I'll let you give it, but instead of thinking of us as a melting pot, you have uh, uh, another musical metaphor that I think is really helpful to think about. So I will just turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. Uh, really great to be here with everyone. Um, yeah, the, the, the metaphor you're referring to um, is the crossfader, um, the horizontal toggle on the bottom of a DJ mixer, standard DJ mixer, that I've tried to use in my thinking about how to connect um, different inputs and find points of common connection to build new mixes. Um, but mixes, in this case, can be new publics, new communities, um, new ways of understanding the world. Uh, and so instead of a melting pot model where all, uh, all of this difference and diversity um, allegedly uh, comes, it, that it all comes together, but in a melting pot model, um, it all actually melts together into singularity, into, um, in history of the U.S. at least, a singular American race. Um, and so for me, the melting pot has never been a useful model. I've always thought of it um, uh, far more of a lie, uh, in fact, and the way people would use it. Uh, and so for me, the crossfader, uh, and the crossfade is, is a, a perhaps a more equitable, um, uh, maybe more radical um, vision of, uh, of what society can actually be, where difference and different inputs are juggled and sustained in the mix instead of faded out and completely erased. Um, but th these issues around publics and spaces that, 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 that keep coming up, I just think are so important, you know, um, and I, I was looking a lot, uh, actually, uh, uh, at you know the work of Quende, who I think in the in the piece that I read at least, I think you you summed it up that the, the stakes of this so beautifully and so well about the beauties uh, on, on the one hand of the kinds of possibilities that that re kind of remote participation and and digitally distance uh, models of coming together can actually provide and be really democratic and really powerful, um, but on the other hand um, there is that longing. Uh, for the thing that we all know, which is that the physical spaces um, and the physical places, be it just outdoors when we all come together or even in those physical spaces, the long history of the role of nightclubs and various kinds of social liberation movements. Um, anyway, I just was really taken by, by, by the way you framed that. 
Thanks, man. No, I mean, um, and I think, you know, a big part of the way I think about it, too, um, uh, and it's it's sort of uh, the way that space can embed a range of different kinds of values into a moment. And so it's like, it's also that, um, uh, it's not just that, you know, there are these new possibilities that are, that, uh, that have emerged as a result of sort of uh, digital interconnectivity, but it's also thinking about sort of, um, uh, how, uh, I guess the idea that these possibilities are possible only for, are still only possible only for a few. And, you know, and the fact that, you know, when we think about the way that space forms a low and uh, sort of like the lowest common denominator of the way that we have sort of done society as a species over the entirety of being a species, it's really hardwired into the way that we, uh, or, or there's, a, there's a facet of it that's hardwired into the way that we do society democratically as well. And, you know, the way that we're able to, uh, the way that uh, sort of the old forms of space or, or the old forms of uh, coming together, I should say, utilizing space as a tool for doing that, how much more democratic that actually is than some of these digital forms of connectivity, which are totally, you know, it's totally, it has a totally different effect walking into a room than jumping into a Zoom meeting. And, you know, these, uh, and, and in terms of the way uh, that you're able to access other people and the conversations that you're able to have uh, and the access that you're able to have to the group uh, is, is different. And so I, what will be interesting to me is sort of to see the way that, um, I guess, as more of the way that we connect becomes digitized, how sort of different uh, sort of power hierarchies and metrics of understanding the way that power is deliberated through uh, convening, how that will map onto these onto these, uh, onto these, uh, into this new form of socialization. You know what I'm saying? It's like, will we see, will it, will it actually just be reflective of existing power structures uh, as a result of, you know, there being this sort of, this, uh, this level of, um, uh, of, of, uh, I, I don't want to call it exclusivity, but, um, but, uh, you know, this, but just the idea that digital space is inherently less democratic than physical space in many ways. And maybe that's a controversial statement to make. I don't know. Well, no, but, I mean, if you see it for those who are participating right now, you know, the host can control, you know, muting someone or not, and, and, and who gets to see which images. And, you know, they're, they're, what is interesting is as effective as it can be to run a meeting, the, the, you know, you can't just voice you, your opinion without the person just going, you know, I'm tired of hearing from you. I will mute you now. So there is a real power structure. And you see it teaching. You see it in music venues. It's very, you know, this is a different type of music venue in that way, which is odd. So, yeah. yeah and I've been doing a bunch of streaming as well. And it has been a real challenge to sort of uh, – sort of take or to, to sort of take all of the uh, uh, all of the uh, intangibles of what a party is and uh, and communicate that via stream well you're not communicating that via stream ultimately you have to give that up sort of yeah. give up you know, all of the all of the the, the, uh, the kinds of um, sort of uh, externalities that come with with the, the pleasurable externalities that come with doing something in live space. And, you know, that's going to be uh, that's going to be something that we're going to have to think about in, in, just in terms of your comment, the Napster moment for live music. So much of the live music experience is actually all of those externalities. Mm -hmm. And without those things, how do we actually think about live music going forward? Yeah. yeah and, 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 you know, we're talking about bodies coming together. Right. And so the, the kind of stakes and responsibilities of a group of strangers um, rubbing elbows, right, and sweating on each other or, you know, existing next to each other um, in anonymity, in the dark, and creating new social formations without even knowing it, that, that is a much different conversation than the kinds of community that can be born um, on a Zoom webinar. Yeah, and, and, and you're reifying the social contract when you do that. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's a big part of what going out at night together is about. It's about sort of like everybody being in a slightly unfamiliar situation and sort of, uh, and confirming the social contract with each other. 
I think there's also something about when you go to a space there, I mean, I'll talk to my students and things like that, and, and I myself, you know, they they might patronize, like they might go to a venue because they just, that space is a safe space. It feels good. They like to be there. And it doesn't really matter who's performing. Uh, that's very different from if you decide to watch a live music thing, you know, webcast online because you're going, oh, I want to hear this. So there's even been a shift of what draws us into a live music performance sometimes. And if I could, could jump in real quick, I mean, I, I think that yeah, you know, the the notion of a social contract is so interesting because I think for a lot of audience members, when they are experiencing an artist where they're participating with their art or they're feeling, you know, the benefits of of of, of the art, you know, I think the implied social contract from the consumer standpoint is that that artist is being being taken care of, that they're being compensated, that they are, you know, able to you know sort of benefit from this exchange from between music fan and musician. And you know, part of the irony that at the same time in the United States, we've had the global shutdown of the music economy or the live music economy at the same time that we've had this amazing awareness and sort of re-engagement around our broader social and economic and, and political structures and systems is bringing a lot of things to the fore at once. And I know Quende in Canada, there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of intentional work for throughout the history of the Canadian music industry to think about the structural failings and inadequacies and challenges sort of having corporate control, you know, structures that have been attempted to be addressed through policy, through nonprofits, through other sectors. I know, Josh, you've been, you know, kind of thinking about some ways in the United States that we may want to start some other strategies to sort of, you know, uh, identify where there have been some failings and some things that we can and should be doing, or the industry can and should be doing to try to address those. So maybe, you know, Quinda, you could speak a little bit about to some of the Canadian models that you know, maybe are unique to Canada, or certainly we don't see in the United States. And then Josh, maybe a little bit about some of the thinking that you're doing about how can we, we can do better and, and, and really challenge um, the status quo. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do sort of the history of the Canadian music industry. Uh, you don't have to do the history of the Canadian music industry, but I mean, just- but, uh, No, I'm joking, uh, I was joking. Um, what I'll- Give five slides. I'll speak about I'll speak about one particular organization that's had a strong impact on the Canadian music industry as a funder of the industry, and it's called Factor, um, and that stands for Foundation for Assisting Canadian Talent on Recordings. And you know, Factor exists uh, mainly because of the U because of you guys, because of the U.S. in many in for, for the most part, because you know the U.S. is a twenty six uh, uh, what is it trillion dollar economy. And Canada is, you know, about a $1.8 trillion economy. And we are next door. And so as a result of that, you know, there's a huge, you know, there's a huge influence of, your, in, of American media networks, American corporate networks, et cetera, um, you know, that influence, you know, Canadian, the, the basically Canadian content producers. So as a result, we have something called uh, the CRTC, which is a, which is very similar to your, um, I can't remember, the FCC, I guess. Um, and it regulates, you know, uh, broadcasters in Canada and regulates how much Canadian content they, are, they have to play and sort of how much foreign content uh, gets played on the radio. And effectively, in the 80s, there was a partnership that got formed between the broadcasters and the federal government, because the broadcasters recognized that they did not have enough Canadian content to play because there wasn't enough that was um, that was uh, uh, that was sort of uh, uh, radio ready. Because as soon as something would become radio ready, it would get picked up by an American company, and they would go to the states, and then we would be back in the same boat. And so, in order to develop the industry here, the radio broadcasters created a small fund. At that point, I think it was one hundred fifty thousand dollars and started building it uh, over time to actually fund the creation of more Canadian content. And over time, they developed this fund to a point where the federal government decided that they should get involved with it through our Department of Canadian Heritage. So we actually have a federal department that deals with culture and heritage. And it's through that department that uh, funds now flow to this not-for-profit organization, which is a foundation called Factor. The organization now manages uh, upwards of $50 million, and it all is uh, there to fund the independent Canadian music industry. So it, it's there to sort of protect against the incursion of 
um, sort of U.S. corporate or global corporate interests, I guess. But, you know, mainly, not mainly U.S., but you guys are the biggest player. And so, but these, these major corporate interests in the sort of content creation ecosystem of Canada. And, um, and yeah, it's been a very successful model uh, for music. And it's a unique model. Um, but, yeah, as I said, it's been successful since about 1982. And I guess to your point about sort of social justice issues, I'll just close by saying Factor is not a social justice organization. It is an organization that is about building uh, successful music companies and successful music careers. Uh, however, as a result of the fact that there is federal money that's associated with it, that federal money comes with strings because there are values that the federal government has and when it spends money, we have to spend it in accordance with some of those values. And so it means that we do have to address issues of diversity and inclusion. We do have to address, uh, you know, indigenous marginalization. We do have to address uh, anti-black violence and some of these things as those things become policies of the federal government. Awesome. So just like the U.S., right, Josh? Uh, yeah. Um, so my, my, my entry point into, the, into this part of the conversation, I suppose, um, these are things I've been teaching about for a long, long time and, and um, working with my students at USC um, on these issues, but came to a head uh, over, over the past, past month or so um, in conversations with, with all the mobilizations uh, and protests and work being done across the United States, especially when I started seeing major labels um, performing, in my opinion, performing their outrage um, and channeling some of that, that, that outrage into significant donations, which is great, um, but wanting to see a larger um, movement toward actually restructuring the way that money is flowing um, in the industry. Particularly, I'm interested in royalties um, and the, the historical inequality and historical injustice built into recording contracts that have disproportionately affected uh, black artists um, who historically themselves and now their, their families uh, and estates um, do not get the money that they're owed. Uh, and so I started talking about musical reparations uh, and immediately started talking about that and finding out that lots of other people are talking about that. And so I've, I've joined up uh, with folks um, at the Black Music Action Coalition, BMAC, uh, and the Breathe with, me, Breathe with Me organization to start actually doing the research uh, to kind of, there's the, a the series of phases. So there's going to be academic research and scholarship about the history of royalty inequality in the United States. I'm putting together a team of scholars to, to kind of pull some of that key and basic information together. Um, and then with the help of BMAC and Breathe with Me, uh, who are working with a large scale coalition of managers and artists and folks in, in, inside the industry and outside, um, to actually uh, create demands and uh, work through a series of action steps. Uh, and so one of the things I'm trying to develop and think about is what would a new digital platform or digital ecosystem, that in my mind I'm calling the big payback, um, what would that look like to allow consumers to actually take action and pay directly um, uh, into the funds of artists who have been victimized by bad contracts. Um, I, and so I, I'm thinking about it in terms of consumers because I simply don't, don't trust and have no reason to historically to trust major labels to do that. Um, there's also frankly too much money at stake. Um, that said, if major labels are ready to do this restructuring around royalties, fantastic. Um, but um, so we're trying to do that research, we're trying to figure it out. Um, and, and it's really brought me back to you know, as a historian, it's brought me back to rethinking the very notion of the recorded music industry globally and trying to understand that if we're looking at the, the, the birth of recordings in Europe, for example, you're talking about, you know, German recordings in and of African colonies. Um, in the history of the United States, the first black recording artist comes from a family of former slaves. The U.S. recording industry is built on the uh, infrastructure of racial capitalism uh, and white supremacy uh, was built on the profit, um, the kind of profit margins of the blackface minstrelsy industry. Um, and I think we, 
you know, those of us who know this and study this history, this is something, this is not new information. Um, but it, I think, is, is um, old information that can be used in a new way at this very important moment. We have a, a great question in from uh, Josh, our mutual friend, Rebecca Gates. Rebecca asks, if we can use this moment to break the pattern of musicians working to support um, right-wing corporations and inequity via playing conservative-owned conservative venues and events? Uh, and, and can that parallel operation thinking around labels or recorded music? So is this an opportunity to look at some of these other structures? I think she's, um, not to put words in Rebecca's mouth, but what comes to mind is um, Anschutz family and, and their involvement in Coachella and that sort of whole uh, you know festival circuit. Yes, um, I, I agree with that and, and would hope so. And I would also extend that to kind of brand partnerships, um, similar to some of the things we heard in the earlier part of the conversation um, you know, in this meeting, um, is that because of the way the, that the industry has been restructured over the past 20 years or so, um, artists have had to look to, for alternative ways of making a living. Because if they're not getting paid through, um, through sales or through streams or uh, through publishing, um, then there's been, as we all know, that move toward um, the musical brand model um, and the, you know, the centrality of syncs and all these things, which means that I think it's become way more of a, of a new normal for artists to, to um, kind of casually um, enter into partnerships with companies that uh, maybe politically they don't see eye to eye with. Um, and I, I know just from anecdotally speaking to so many different kinds of artists who've had to make all kinds of decisions in their head about is this a good deal? Is this a bad deal? Just on moral grounds, um, the Coachella, you know, breaking the Coachella uh, stranglehold is a is a very good question and a very difficult one to answer. Yeah, no easy answers there, but it's certainly an important question. And, and I'd just like to ask one last thing for for the three of you. Oh, I, um, I think Quinday had one, wanted to add on that one. Oh, I'm sorry, Quinday. Go ahead. Apologies. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just going to say that um, you know some of like the question around. Uh, sort of, you know, not not just some of the interests that were that were sort of identified there, but I guess in Canada, some of these larger corporate interests, uh, which sometimes are synonymous with, uh, you know, the, the the group being sort of intimated at here, um, you know, those there's a there was a, a a federal program that just got rolled out through Factor for supporting the live music industry, and it was exclusionary of sort of these types of corporate interests. So they're not actually able to apply for this money, for this sort of bailout money. It's exclusive to uh, Canadian owned companies that operate in the live music space. Uh, and so like, you know, um, it's challenging because some of these, I guess, you know, these are American corporations ultimately. Some of, some of like, yeah, Live, live Nation is an American corporation and so is AEG, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and so, you know, I, I guess you couldn't use the same kind of uh, screening mechanism, but the, the idea of some kind of uh, differentiation between the independent side of the industry versus this other side of the industry uh, and sort of the, in, in terms of the way you think about resourcing uh, will be important because they're so in, in, in the U.S. especially, they're so enmeshed. Well, I've got just, we're, we're short on time, but I, I want to just take this in one last direction briefly, which is, you know, I think we can all safely in this conversation, you know, sort of um, agree that, you know, Anne is my generation have probably not done the best job taking care of the music community. And it's been a, a difficult transition from an analog to a digital industry. But I think most music activists would sort of recognize and value the importance of the generational transition and make sure that you know, the analog generation is making way for new people with new vision and new relationship to technology and community and how music is made and shared and accessed. And a lot of that is happening at the university level and people like our producer, Alex and, and Josh, the students that you work with and the students you work with, when the people that you interact with all the time, especially in a moment of the loss of, of again, physical interaction, the uncertainty with what's happening on campuses, what, if anything, can and should we be thinking about over the next year or so about how we're making sure this isn't a moment where we're just, again, we're talking earlier about networks that we're not just sort of 
you know, re-strengthening, you know, the, the sort of existing networks that maybe have not, leadership networks that maybe have not got the job done, but we're really thinking about what does it mean to authentically transfer leadership to those emerging generations? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I would say the one thing that uh, has come up just by having conversations with students as they're going through this is, you know, when we talk about music and when we talk about um, kind of what it means and what it symbolizes and all those sorts of things, I think a lot of students who really did a lot of live music, went to concerts a lot, um, got an instant gratification out of that that maybe didn't think too deeply about why they were choosing what they wanted to go or who they wanted to listen to or what the music meant or what the lyrics were. I think this time of being at home um, had a lot of people go to music that they loved live and really listen to it on a deeper level. And there, be, there was a deeper understanding of what that music symbolizes, what it means. Um, and so I, if, if one is going to see a silver lining in this, I think if we think of human flourishing, you know, how, how music sort of helps folks, we've gone from the gratification like eating a piece of cake and, wow, that was delicious, but it didn't, wasn't really good for me, to um, having deeper thoughts and conversations about what the music means, maybe a little bit more nutritious in that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, one thing that I'm thinking about or I, and that I'm going to be writing about next it has to do with networks and the ways in which uh, this period of time uh, has or the effect that this period of time has had on the networks that we connect to and uh, whether those whether it means that we've increasingly connected to sort of like globalized networks or that we've actually dug into our localized networks more understanding the relationship between those two scales of network and sort of how to, uh, you know, in as healthy a way as possible, disintermediate them. Uh, so that there is some, there is almost sort of like a, uh, you know, that, that there's a, 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 yeah, a clear point of differentiation between sort of those, that local and global network and that uh, we sort of, it might be an opportunity to shift uh, the, the power relationship between them. And I think that, you know, that'll, uh, that's something that, yeah, we should be thinking about how to take advantage of uh, right now. I, I, I would add maybe it's just that in the work that I do with, with my undergraduate students in particular who, um, you know, want to go into the music industry in one form or another, and, and they're, they're, they're first, here in Los Angeles at least, they're, you know, their first idea is, oh, I want to go work in Golden Voice or Vibe Nation, and that's just because it's right there in front of them, and it seems like, oh, they put on the, the shows I go to, and they, were, they work with the artists that I love, and that kind of thing. But once we then talk through that, um, the, the more critically minded of them, or the ones who have also studied um, various bodies of work around critical literature, around uh, identity and society and economics and culture and race, um, is they realize that, that there's another way. Um, and so what I've increasingly started to see, I'd say, which are two different paths. One is that um, they want to go into uh, a company um, that's well-established, um, like Apple Music or Spotify, but go into those companies with a critical mindset and with the desire to say, well, I'm actually armed with this history of what the music industry is, and I'm armed with the history of how race works and how gender works and sexual harassment works in all these industries, and, and I'm not going to stand by and let that happen, and I want to rise to the top and become that next leader. And then the other path is, I don't, it, it's a student saying, I don't want to go to those, those big companies, and I'm going to start my own shop, and I'm going to come together with my friends, and we're going to do grassroots style, and especially at this moment when there are no rules, um, that I, I'm seeing so many students saying, we're going to create our own businesses based on a totally different model of networking, of friendship, uh, and of values. And I think that over the next five years, we're going to see some really exciting new music and culture models um, that might not threaten, you know, the kind of very large companies, but are certainly going to create um, alternative models. I think that's a great way to, to end it. It's going to be an amazing uh, next couple of years. You know, what's the cliche about interesting times? So, um, but thank you, as always, Anna and Quende and Josh, thank you so much for joining us. And, and of course, Rick, Christine, and Greg uh, from Charlotte for presenting earlier. Alex, our producer at Georgetown University for hosting us. Um, all of our friends and, and board members and team members from Music Cities together. And of course, 
uh, all of you who have spent uh, a bunch of your Friday with us. Um, as always, this program will be put on our YouTube archive over the weekend. If you thought this was interesting and want to share it with your friends and networks, please feel free to do so. Questions, comments, concerns, ideas, uh, all that great stuff, send it to musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. And I uh, hope everybody has a safe and productive week. We'll see you next Friday. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.